I am still learning how to do Sunday school and get done on time. I, uh, I was like, I don't even know what time it is. So I apologize for being a little behind the schedule here. But then apparently there's still people coming in and sitting down. So maybe I'm not the only one. I don't know these people. They're <laughs> you are uh, very welcome this morning. That is your unofficial welcome. Mark will give us our official worship leader welcome in a moment. But I did want to let folks know a little bit about, uh, again, our Sunday school. Uh, we are meeting again as a, as a group. Uh, this coming week will have a slight change, and that is that our adult Sunday school classes will be splitting into two groups. Uh, Dave Pavlek is going to be starting a survey of the Old Testament um, where he'll be doing book by book by book by book. That's the last I heard. He has the freedom to change that if he wants to, but that is kind of where we're at on that. Um, and so he'll be meeting in one room, and then I'll just take the Romans group, the, the remainder of the folks that want to do Romans, over to the, uh, the other classroom, and we'll, we'll meet there. I do want to encourage you to give Dave's... Uh, I know, you're, I know for, we've already had Romans for two Sundays, and you're all invested in Romans now. So, but you can set it down and go through the Old Testament with Dave. That would be perfectly fine. Um, and uh, I'd like to kind of get a, a nice even split on our on our group size on that, just for the sake of being able to spread out a little bit. Um, so uh, be thinking about that next Sunday, 9.45 to 10.45, not 10.52 like I did today. So uh, we will uh, try to keep those things on tap. But I do want to invite you to think about Sunday school, coming back to Sunday school as, uh, as you are comfortable. Uh, more and more folks are feeling like they can get out, which is oh, awesome. So that's the only announcement I have. Mark, begin our service if you would. Good morning, morning. and welcome. So, for this morning, I'm going to start out with a Psalms, and I'm going to read Psalms 47. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to the Lord this with loud songs of joy, for the Lord, the Most High, is awesome, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is king of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. God is king over all nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. And in reading that, it just hit me in, in some of the traditional brother things. Singing, dancing, and shouting was not considered proper. And I'm going, but in the Psalms, it talks about it all the time. So if you would, uh, join me in an opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to come together and sing praises to you and worship. And as we hear John's message, may you open our hearts and let his words in through you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now, I'll read Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in the nation and on the earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or I can't say the word because I've seen him. Uh, in case you didn't know, I'm actually dyslexic, so it, at times it gets me. Denominations or, or dominions, that's the word, dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all 
all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And let's sing praises to God. Let's stand as we sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, 259. Don't put your hymnal away, though. I was going to give a kid story, but I don't see any kids this morning. Daylight savings time. <laughs> so. <laughs> you would have slept. <laughs> what I was going to share with the kids, I'll share with you a little bit, and then we'll sing this next song. Um, in the text that we're going to look at, there's a passage about the disciples going through and gathering in a, a heads of wheat and, and, and eating them. And the Pharisees uh, you know, were a little upset about that because it doesn't follow the strict legal interpretation of harvesting and threshing. And uh, I remember growing up on the farm and going and finding these heads of wheat uh, that were getting on ripe and everything like that. And I, you know, take a head of wheat off and you put it in your hand and you rub it, you know, and you blow the chaff off. And I thought about doing that with the kids and then I realized that eh, really should be done outside. Um, <laughs> but we would, you know, do that. And I thought I was the first person to ever come up with that. I thought, boy, look at this, you know, here's, this is how you get the wheat, you know, you have that in your hand and I'm realizing, oh no. That's been going on for a long time. That's exactly what the disciples were doing whenever uh, the Pharisees saw them. And the question becomes, what is right to do on the Sabbath? And obviously that brings up all the other questions about what the Sabbath is and what day we should be observing that and how we need to be observing that and how to keep it holy and the gist of what I was going to share with the kids, and you'll get a little more of this in the sermon too, was that holiness is more than the rules. Whenever you do something good, that is holy. And the day maybe doesn't matter so much. So we'll talk about that a little later in the message too, so I'll be thinking about that. But what I was going to share with the kids is that I was not the first one to come up with that. 
Uh, Jesus' disciples that were doing that a long time ago. So let's, let's sing another song. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. On 491, if you're using the hymnal. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. like to call attention again to the passage that Mark read from Colossians. That is a powerful testament to who Jesus is. It is, I don't think you could really come up with language that was more, more powerful than that. And it does have bearing on where we're headed today. So be remembering that passage as we, as we look at this text from Mark. Jesus is something special. Chapter 2, verse 18 through 28 for our text today. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came to him and said, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, The wedding guest cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth to an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, and the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost. So, all, so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. One Sabbath, he was going along through the grain field, going, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, 
Have you, not, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. And then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Back when I was doing construction for a living, there was a, a gentleman, a colleague he, he, that uh, I worked alongside a little bit. He didn't work in the, he was a heating and cooling guy. And he came in and, and did furnaces and duct work and whatnot. And, and he was actually in charge of the company. He uh, made a lot of decisions for the company. And he was a Christian man. And uh, he had a particular perspective on fasting he would make it a point to fast before he made any kind of significant decision on behalf of the company. He wanted to pray about it and to reflect on it. And he felt that when he fasted, his prayers were more focused, uh, more meaningful, perhaps. Now, I don't know where you stand. I think you can tell that I'm not a big faster. Um, but I find it difficult. I find it uh, that, that I don't have more focus. I don't uh, find more meaning. And most of the time, I just get distracted by how hungry I am, which I think takes me the wrong direction when it comes to fasting. I don't think very clearly. Maybe I need to do it more, or maybe I need to do it differently. I don't know. But fasting is a little tricky for me. And I'm not really sure whether this, uh, this gentleman received any divine guidance when uh, for his business because of his fasting. He was just trying to be faithful to what he felt called to. In our culture, which is a culture that is, uh, values immediate gratification of every desire, the idea of setting those things aside, whether it be a meal uh, when we're fasting or a day when we can't uh, do everything that we feel like we want to do, setting those things aside even temporarily, it seems a little weird to us. Fasting, well, that's something that the, that the super Christians do, the, the ascetics do. That's not for normal people. Uh, and this passage, it might be partially responsible for that, uh, for the church's ambivalent attitude towards fasting. Even though fasting has a long and a rich history in the life of the church, it's, it's not something that a great many of us participate in on a regular basis, at, le at least to the extent that it's illustrated here in this passage. Sabbath observance, that's another one of those things. Kind of sometimes on again, off again. You know, we don't always really think about it. Uh, many Christians at least don't. What is the Sabbath day? What, how are we supposed to treat it? What are we supposed to do or, or perhaps not do on that particular day? How many of you remember the blue laws where the whole town shut down on Sunday because that was the Sabbath day and you don't conduct business on the Sabbath day? Not such a big deal anymore at least in certain parts of the country. There's a lot of different ideas, a lot of different perspectives, a lot of opinions, different convictions. It seems like that perhaps we're having these debates that really weren't that uh, strange back in those days. Even in Jesus' day, there were people that were wondering what the proper response to the Sabbath was. And so we read this text, and Mark is telling us something, and Jesus is telling us something. So what is Jesus saying here? Are we supposed to fast? Or not? What does it mean to keep and honor the Sabbath day, how to, uh, to treat it as holy? What, what is a faithful follower supposed to do? Today we're in the middle of these controversy stories. We began back at the beginning of chapter 2 uh, with, the, with the man that was healed in the presence of the Pharisees and uh, lower down through the roof. Last week we looked at this calling of Levi, the tax collector, and how Jesus went home with him and had dinner with him. And uh, so there's quite a bit of material in that story, so we gave it its own message. Today I want to take two of the five stories and combine them, put them together. I know that we could probably talk about each of them individually. There's plenty here to consider in each story. But again, if we look too closely at things, we get right up to it and examine every little piece of it, we might miss something that stepping back and away from it might bring into focus. Mark does a wonderful job of taking these conflict stories and bringing them together and organizing them in an orderly way. 
The first story we heard there in Capernaum in that house that the roof was opened up, that's a healing story. That's a miracle. And the last one that we're going to see in chapter 3, that's also a healing story, another miracle. So we're bookended here. Two healing stories, two miracles that, that call the established status quo into question and clearly show us Jesus' power, not only over the religious establishment, but over life and the natural world itself. Now, in between these two bookends, there are these three stories, one, two, three, and each of them has something to do with eating. That's how Mark ties them together. The one we looked at last week has to do with who you can eat with, whether it's okay to eat with sinners and tax collectors, and Jesus clearly says, yes, it is. It's the sinners that need Jesus, and if they recognize their need, then Jesus is more than happy to be with them. Today, we're going to look at the other two eating stories, challenges to Jesus' authority. The first one is about eating too much, and the second one is about eating improperly. In both stories, Jesus is challenging the establishment, the, the common understanding, how people viewed the world, and Jesus introduces something new, something innovative, a miracle in and of itself. So the first of these two stories, like we said, has to do with fasting. It was apparently the tradition for both the followers of John the Baptist and the followers of the Pharisees to take time to fast, to not eat for a period of time. And fasting has a long biblical history. It's played a part in the religious life of Jesus' contemporaries all the way back to the time of Moses. So they would have been familiar with this idea of fasting. Now, I'm not sure if it was the case But it looked like more people fasted than didn't in those times. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But it certainly was part of the landscape. Now, we could spend a lot of time talking about that, the biblical precedent, the warrant for fasting, why people might do it. But we don't need to. So we're not going to go that direction. Just this point. Essentially, it was an accepted and a valued part of the landscape, the fabric of the religious life of the day. Devout people fasted. That's just what you did. And so because Jesus is supposed to be the leader of a religious group, this, this subgroup, this, uh, this, this new thing in Judaism, then it only made sense that he would fast, just like the rest of the groups. Well, they didn't. The second one, the second challenge that we have, also has to do with eating in a way. But instead of eat who that they ate with or how much they ate, it has to do with when. They ate. The disciples were apparently again walking by this grain field and plucking heads of grain and doing that thing that I thought I came up with, which I didn't, and taking a little bit of the grain and eating it as they went along. Now, the Pharisees saw this. Now, remember last week we talked a little bit about the Pharisees. We, we, we said that they were the, this group of people that wanted to try to get everybody to follow the appropriate laws, observe the law, obedience to the law. That was a big deal for the Pharisees. And so when they saw these disciples harvesting, and that's the problem, not so much the eating, and then threshing the grain, and that's the problem, not so much the eating, what they saw were people not following the prohibitions on labor on the Sabbath. They were working, and they shouldn't have been doing that. According to that strict, and the Pharisees were strict in a lot of things, and that literal, and they could be very literal as well, interpretation of the tradition, what the disciples were doing was not allowed. They weren't supposed to. It was, wasn't so much the eating part of it, but what was necessary for them to eat it. Now, if we include the story that we looked at last week, the one about Levi and that dinner at the house with all those other sinners and tax collectors, then we get a pretty long list of offenses here. It's like Jesus is is just, oh boy, he's rubbing them the wrong way every turn. We got, you don't eat meals. You don't have table fellowship with these kind of people, with unclean people. And it's not a matter of the lack of compassion. It wasn't, that wasn't the problem, at least on the surface. This is a violation of the law. This is a violation of the rule to stay clean. That's what you're supposed to do is be clean. And then, and maybe people were thinking back to that feast that they were having at Levi's house, the the followers of Jesus are accused of not fasting. They're they're partying too much. They're having too much fun. They're eating all the time. It's like, don't you ever 
give up on that for a while? Don't you take a, a moment? They were less than devout because they weren't following that fasting tradition. And finally, in this last one, they're, they're essentially they're just scoff laws. They just don't even care about the law anymore. Look at them, harvesting grain, threshing grain on the Sabbath day. Just one thing after another. It's almost like the rules don't apply to these guys. The followers of Jesus are portrayed as rule breakers, as unclean, as unpious, as less than righteous. And Jesus, because he's in charge, he's the one leading them, he's the worst offender at all. It's one thing to do the wrong thing. It's another entirely to teach people to do the wrong thing, at least in their eyes. So, like I said, five stories, five conflict stories, and then three in the middle about eating. And then these two, these two have something in common. It just shows Mark's just wonderful aptitude with the text, the way he does it. There's a pattern here. There's a way of looking at these two stories as a, as a unit. It gives us a clue to that bigger picture we might see when we step back a little bit. It's another one of those sandwich constructions that I was talking about a few weeks ago where with the similarity at the beginning with what happens at the end, the two things are kind of similar, and then there's something meaty there in the middle. Verses 21 and 22 are that meaty part, and we'll take a little extra time to examine that in a moment. But let's look at the, the surrounding stories first. When Jesus is presented with a question, when someone comes to him and says, hey, why is this happening? What, what's going on here? Jesus does a wonderful job, a masterful job of meeting that challenge. In that first story, in the first section where the disciples are challenged because they didn't fast like the other religious groups, Jesus responds with this wonderful parable of the bridegroom. Why should members of the wedding party fast? That doesn't make sense. It's not a time of fasting. It's a time of celebration. It's a time of joy. It's not a time of privation. It's not a time to be, oh, it's so bad. We're waiting for something to happen. That's an element of fasting that comes to us from the Old Testament. It's a good time. It's a feast time. Clearly, we're supposed to see Jesus as the bridegroom in the text. That's, that's his place to play. And his followers, they're the attendants. They're the, the guests at the wedding feast. And there's joy in the presence of Jesus. Why not feast? And you can imagine what was going on in Levi's house. Finally, to be welcomed, to be embraced, to be treated as something other than some kind of piece of garbage to be kicked to the curb. That's joy. There's feasting there. Why not feast? And yeah, there's a little darkness, a little foreshadowing there, a storm cloud on the horizon, the, uh, as Jesus alludes to that time when the fasting would be appropriate. But for now, let's feast. The second challenge, the one about harvesting and eating on the Sabbath, that's countered with a, an even more powerful statement. After offering a, an explanation from Scripture, which is really interesting and complex in and of itself. Uh, we're, we don't have time to go into it, but it's a great, a great little thing there. Jesus simply states that the original intent of the Sabbath, the reason that God gave humanity the Sabbath, was for the benefit of humanity. It was for the good of humanity. And so, the things that benefited humanity ought to be lawful on the Sabbath. And then there's that most powerful part, the conclusion here. He says that he has the right to make this statement. I can tell you what's appropriate on the Sabbath because the Son of Man, and that's how he refers to himself throughout the Gospel of Mark, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So, like I mentioned, there's plenty here in each of these stories to want, warrant its own sermon. We could, we could talk at length on there's, there's the things about the way Jesus uses parables, the metaphorical language, this wedding feast. That's the first instance in Mark where Jesus tells a parable to explain something. And then that, that dark foreshadowing in that parable, the, the first time that Jesus alludes to his own death and the inherent violence, you, you get that. The bridegroom stays at the wedding feast. They, that's theirs, and everybody else goes home. The bridegroom is not taken from the, from the wedding feast. That's a, there's, a, there's, a, a, there's a subtext there of, of force and violence of what's to come. 
You could go on and unpack all of the complexity of that argument about David and the, and the, the bread of the presence. That's in the second story. There's a lot of stuff there that we could talk about. You could talk about the place of the law and who observed it and who it was expected to observe it and the difference between the religious elite and the common folks and, and how, what it came to keeping the law. There's plenty there that we could discuss too. And above all, we could talk about the place of things like fasting and Sabbath observance in the life of the church today, whether or not that's appropriate and how we would live that out. It, these practices are still part of our life as followers of Jesus. So what rules should govern their observance what are we supposed to do? All of this we could talk about. As interesting as it might be, though, it's here that we need to look at that center section, the meat in our sandwich. Whether this is an extension of the first story or if it's an independent saying of Jesus that Mark puts into this space, it has impact on both what comes before and what comes after. It's more of that metaphorical language that Jesus was so fond of using. You see, nobody takes a new, unshrunk piece of fabric and sews it onto an old garment. Those of you who've done repairs on, on clothes, you know that this is the case. I used to have a quilt that had one square of wool that they had pieced in with the rest of the pieces. And then when it got washed the first time, that wool shrunk down about like that, and it just puckered all the fabric and everything around it, and, and it makes sense what Jesus is saying here. You don't, you don't do that. <laughs> it pulls hard on the rest of the fabric. He says that not matching fabrics is a way to destroy the whole garment. And the same thing is true about the wine and the wineskins. You don't put new wine in old wineskins. That ongoing fermentation process creates a pressure that that old stretched out wineskin just can't handle. Old wine in old wineskins, new wine in new wineskins. That's what Jesus is telling us. And now here's where we might be tempted to overanalyze a little bit. Parables? Parables can be tricky. The temptation is to try to read more into it than is really there. It's not an allegory where everything means something else. There's just a couple points here I think that Jesus wants us to, to get a hold of, a, a couple of truths that we need to take to heart. The first has to do with what is appropriate. Jesus is saying, you know what, there are things that are appropriate when it comes to observing the law. When the bridegroom is at the feast, then feasting is appropriate. When people need to eat, then harvesting is appropriate. Those are appropriate things to do. And I want you to think about this. I invite you to consider this in terms of our ethical choices. What do we do that's appropriate? What do we do that's inappropriate? Or maybe if you want to sharpen it up a little bit, what does it mean to follow the rules? Now what Jesus seems to be saying here is that there are times when the rules, as we understand them, may not apply. That it may be inappropriate to follow the rules. There are times when what is considered proper, when what is considered pious, might need to be set aside for the sake of something bigger. So picture this. A corral full of cattle. And they're in the, cattle, in the corral and it looks like the rancher came and just opened the gate. And the cattle are there in the corral and they're standing there and they're looking at this open gate and they're looking at the rancher and they're going, uh, what are we supposed to do here? Well, can we just run off anywhere we want to go now? Well, if you've worked with cattle, you know the answer to that is yes. But... For Christians, we've got to remember what Paul says in Romans 6. That by no means should we run off into sin just because God offers us grace. While we may not be constrained by the law like we were before, that doesn't mean that there's no morality. That doesn't mean that there are no ethical choices to make. There's doesn't mean that there's not appropriate behavior. Those things that the law was supposed to ensure happened. Holiness is still a part of who we are, or should be. It's, it's still essential. Piety is still expected. Sanctification, that's the path that we're on. Becoming increasingly holy, make no mistake. And so what exactly is Jesus doing here? When he seems to say that, that there are exceptions to the law, when he seems to open the gate on this corral that we're so used to. There's a theological term for it. You ready to write this down? You don't have to write it down. Anti 
Nomianism. Blah, 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 blah. Basically, that's the mistaken belief that we are no longer liable to any moral law because of God's grace. There's no such thing as law because God's grace covers everything. It's an anti-law position, and it is not what Jesus is advocating here. An ethical free-for-all where that gate is thrown open wide and there's open country all around us. You probably caught this. We're not overanalyzing here, but what is the cloak supposed to represent in Jesus' parable? How about the old wineskins? Probably the law. Probably things like the law. And at least in the first story, and it's implied in the second, Jesus is not interested in destroying those things. He's kind of interested in preserving them and taking care of them and making sure that they're still functional in the way that they should be. They're not done away with. It's just that they're not always appropriate when it comes to what is new. In some ways, the law has gotten a little worn and threadbare. Perhaps it has been stretched as far as it possibly could go, and any more ferment is going to break it. But that's what Jesus brings. New cloth, new wine. He's offering a new way of thinking the thinking of ethics and of moral decision-making, one that's not solely based on these old rigid patterns and practices. It's not that the old was useless, that it didn't have meaning anymore. It was just that it couldn't handle what Jesus was doing to it without some damage. So new patterns, new practices have to be envisioned. New garments and new wineskins with the flexibility and the strength to reflect that dynamic reign of God, the way that the kingdom of God was breaking into the world. That's the core of the gospel message. So it makes sense, right? So far, so good. We're kind of, okay, we're getting along with this, but there's, there's a problem that comes up almost immediately. See, on the one hand, Jesus is certainly suggesting that there's a new way of doing things, a new ethical, holy, decision-making process. That's in order. It's time for new wineskins and new garments. And since the challenges he faced are are connected to the old, connected to that that religious establishment, connected to the status quo, the old wineskins, the old garments, then we might think, okay, Jesus brings the new and he's challenged by the old. We might get to be misled into thinking that Jesus came to do away with this old stuff, to get rid of this old stuff, the old laws. No more fasting. We don't want to do that anyway. It makes me hungry. No more Sabbath rules. That's just too restrictive. The gate's open. Let's go. Let's run. It's wide open in front of us. But that doesn't really ring true, does it? We know that that's not the way to sanctification. That's not the way to holiness. That's not how we become holy, by just doing whatever we want to do. If there's a way to righteousness that's not completely dependent on God's willingness to forgive us of our continual sin, if there's another way to it, if we genuinely don't want to sin so that grace can abound, then there's got to be some rules. There's got to be some sort of, a, of guidelines for us to follow, some commands that Jesus wants us to obey. There has to be a corral. The illustrations that Jesus uses in these stories as well as the testimony of his entire life everything that he taught and everything that he did it shows us that jesus is absolutely not interested in a free-for-all go and do whatever you want it doesn't matter forgiveness is there grace is there just go have fun that's not really what jesus is interested in he doesn't come to do away with the law he comes to fulfill the law he doesn't remove the old commands and get rid of them he gives us new commands Commands that encompass perfectly the desire of God's heart. What Jesus seems to be most concerned about here isn't whether or not there are rules, but the way that those rules have taken precedence in our lives as they've become the most important thing that we think of. This is very overly simplistic, I know, to say this. But in broad strokes, the religious elite, the the folks that are challenging Jesus in these stories, they acted as if observance of the law was indicative of and necessary. It was what had to be done in order to be considered 
righteous in God's eyes in order to be part of God's covenant community. You kept the law. You followed the rules. And that showed that you were justified or righteous in God's sight. You break the law. You don't follow the law. That means that you are out. You are not in the in crowd. You are out. Now, they certainly believed that God was loving. They certainly believed that he forgave people and that God was full of abundant mercy. But the overall picture, the overall marker of who was in God's favor had to do with keeping the law. And again, broad strokes, a little simplistic, a lot more dynamic than that in real life. But that's the basic picture that we have. This infatuation with the rules, it's it's the same problem that we have today. We struggle with this very same thing. We can be just as concerned with keeping our laws and our idea of what is right and wrong as the Pharisees were in keeping their laws and what they thought was right and wrong. And what's happened over and over and over again is that we've traded the old law, the old garment, the old wineskins for something new, but it's still garments and wineskins. And rules are important, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not an antinomianist. I, don't, I, I think that we need to have these things. We have to have guides for our ethical moral choices. We have to have parameters for our behavior. We need a corral to keep us where we need to be, boundaries that are both appropriate and, and, and necessary. But the rule is not the point. The boundary is not the point. Jesus is the point. And this is where that Colossians passage should hit you right, right in the heart. Jesus is the point. The rules don't tell us when and how a rule might be appropriate or not. But Jesus does. Go to that last verse, verse 28. The Sabbath. And here the Sabbath stands in for all of the rules. The Sabbath was made for humanity not the other way around. You see, we're not slaves to the law. The law is supposed to serve us. It's supposed to help us. It's supposed to protect us. It's supposed to benefit us. It's not the other way around. And when it begins to look that, like we're slaves to the law, like we're slavishly following the law, In reality, we're not really slaves to the law. We've become slaves to those people who are arbiters and interpreters of the law, the ones who control the law and tell you which laws to follow and tell you which rules that you you can do with here and there and where you can go and what you can do. They're the ones with the decision making power. And when we are slaves to the law, we are truly slaves to them. That law, that's just a tool. That's just a tool. It's an instrument of subjugation, of control, not to the law itself, but to those who control the law. And whether it's the Pharisees of Jesus' day or the overly legalistic folks today, when we submit to their authority, we are taking again that yoke of slavery on us. We are chaining ourselves to something that we are, were once set free from in Christ, like, just like Paul says in Galatians 5. You see, ultimately, it's not about the rules. It's not about the law. It's a matter of authority. Who is in charge? Who gets to make the decisions? Jesus doesn't come and say, we're just not going to have any more rules anymore. We're going to do away with the rules. What he does away with is our bondage to the rules that chain us to this harsh, dogmatic, rigid, legalistic laws that fail to speak to the dynamic situations that we find ourselves in all the time. And in the place of our submission to the law and to those people who have control of the law, Jesus offers us freedom. The freedom of serving him. The freedom of following him. The freedom of being his child. Our focus shifts from which which rules that we're going to follow and how we're going to apply them to who we follow. And then we fast. Not because the rule says that we should fast. Not because those other people are fasting. But because by fasting we might 
have a chance to understand more fully what it means to be with the least of these and what they experience, a lost, hungry sister or brother. We observe the Sabbath. We keep it holy, not because it's the law, not because it's a rule, but because by doing so, it's a chance for us to show our trust in the one who provides all things and the one who says to us, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And we feast. We feast. We celebrate because of our faith and our trust in Jesus is a source of incomparable joy. Keeping the rules is important, but it's not the most important thing. And we're not righteous because of the rules that we keep. We're not righteous because of the laws that we, that we hold to. We are righteous because God has made us righteous through the blood of Christ. That's God's work. That's not something we do. And because of that, because of what Jesus has done, and because of what Jesus is doing, and because of who Jesus is, then the rules don't bind us. They free us. We can find freedom even in the rules. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, following rules is easier for us than following you. And so we get caught up in the rules, in the laws, and the rituals, and the practices, and all of the things that on the surface have the appearance of wisdom, but in the end can't save us. Lord, when we have valued the rules over our relationship with you, we ask your forgiveness. And we trust that you will forgive. Help us to follow you, to follow Jesus, to be devoted to him and to keep our eyes clearly placed on the one who leads us, the head of the church, the one who redeems and not on all the things that he asks us to do. And that will come, we know. But it's Christ alone who gives us our guidance and our strength to be faithful. We want to follow. Not rules, but Christ. Help us to do it. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's stand and sing our last song. Lord, let us now depart in peace, who in thy name are gathered here. Lord, let us now depart in peace, who in thy name are gathered here. Disclose the brightness the Amen. Amen. Bow with me once again. Be forever near, Lord. We know that you are present in every moment, whether we want it or not. And we are, when we are lucid, grateful for that. Guide these, your people, Keep them safe in what they do. Give them opportunities to share your love, to be gracious, to be merciful. I pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. You may go in peace.